Well, thank you uh, for coming tonight. I see many of the same faces I saw last night, so that's always encouraging uh, that you come back. And I trust as we bring this short conference to a close that our appetites will be whetted for the search for Christ uh, in the Old Testament. And if that is your objective and that is your goal, uh, you will not be disappointed. Uh, for indeed, Christ uh, is there in that whole redemptive message. Tonight, we're going to uh, pick up really where we left off last evening. It's significant that we just sang Psalm 89. We closed our discussion last night with consideration of the Davidic covenant. And Psalm 89 is the great inspired commentary on the covenant that God made with David. So it's very appropriate. This thing working, it seems to. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? I say Psalm 89 is the great uh, inspired commentary on Psalm, on David's covenant and his own reflection upon the faithfulness of God in fulfilling his work. Now, in our discussions last time, we can get a running start of where we left off. We were looking last night at the revelation of Christ in the covenants as the covenants, these various installments of the covenant of grace are focusing particularly upon the identity of who the Messiah, the first reverser, is going to be. As we begin with uh, the statement of Genesis 3.15, and I emphasize how important that is going to be in our search for Christ in the Old Testament. And we learn in the very first promise uh, of the Redeemer that it'll be a man. It's the seed of a woman as God is going to reverse the curse to this one that comes into humanity. Then we come to that covenant with Noah and it's going to build upon what has already been given and give us an advancement of that knowledge. And we learn that now this man will be of the line of Shem, a Semite, and he's going to be God as well, the incarnation. Then the Abrahamic covenant, submitting man to the line of Abraham. Then from Isaac in the line of Abraham, submitting man from Jacob, from Isaac, from Abraham, all building but yet expanding. And then a submitting man from the tribe of Judah, from Jacob, from Isaac, and from Abraham. And then finally the Davidic covenant, we know the very family. So by the time we end the Old Testament scriptures, we know the very family into which the Lord Jesus is going to come. And it's not surprising then that as we come to the uh, New Testament, that it begins right where the Old Testament left off. Here is Jesus all the way back to Adam. Now, I emphasized as well that while the covenant is narrowing down, narrowing down, narrowing down the identification of who the Messiah is going to be. It always has a universal application. And I emphasize that the, the promise of Messiah in the Old Testament was never, ever uniquely a Jewish promise. That was clear from the beginning ones. Uh, Abraham, all the families of the Lord being blessed, and even David. Didn't have a chance to touch on this last night because the clock beat me to it. But the testimony of David, David receives this wonderful promise from the Lord, and he realizes, and you can see there in the following verses in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that he's amazed that the Lord will be speaking to him and his house in this way, giving him that promise. But yet he goes beyond that, and he says, Lord, this is not just for my house. And he says, this this revelation, Torah, revelation, is for mankind. David realized that this promise that was given to him in regard to the identity of the Messiah was universal. It was for all mankind. And certainly Jesus 
is the savior then of the world. So we have this narrowing down. We have this narrowing down leading then we're not surprised who Christ is going to be. Now, in our discussion last night, we were focusing then on the identity of the cursed reverser. And some of you observed that I left something out. I went all the way from I went all the way from the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, all the way to David and didn't say anything about the Mosaic covenant. And that was on purpose. <laughs> the Mosaic covenant is a covenant with Israel, but it focuses now upon the work of the Messiah and not the identity. The identity and all of these others, but now with the Mosaic covenant, I say the attention is going to be upon what the curse reverser is going to do to reverse the curse. And that really transitions to what we want to discuss this evening. Because much of the revelation of Christ that we have in the Mosaic covenant uh, is going to be through these pictures, these picture prophecies uh, that we want to talk about. So that's our theme this evening, talking about picture prophecies, types, and I put down some notes here so I don't ramble as much as I did last night. Uh, so I, I know where I'm going to be going here. Types, divinely inspired prophetic analogies. And these are picture prophecies that God is giving us pictures. They say that pictures are worth a thousand words. I, I'm not sure if that equation is accurate or no, but there is something about pictures. There's something about pictures that help us understand. How, how many of you uh, you know, buy something that you can put together and you have instructions and you also have pictures? Uh, if, if you're like me, you tend to look at the pictures more than you do the uh, written instructions. Uh, pictures help. Pictures help us to understand. And God gave pictures, keeping in mind now that those people then didn't have what we have. We have the entirety of God's revelation. And we have the totality of this Bible, this inspired word. But they didn't have that. How did God reveal truth? Well, he spoke to them in various ways, Hebrews tells us. But one of the ways that God spoke to people and spoke to his covenant people uh, during this historic time was through pictures, through analogies. And, and these picture prophecies, uh, technically we're going to call them types. We're talking about typology uh, this evening. These picture prophecies that the Lord is giving in order to convey spiritual truths. Look at this. I, I like to think of types here in, in, in the context of X and Ys. All right, here's an X. And God is saying, look at X. Look at X to learn something about Y. X is going to be the historic phenomenon. X is going to be the historic person or place or thing. We'll set that up here in a little bit. God is saying, look at this. And as you look at this, I want you to, I, I want you to see why, and why is going to be the reality, going to be Christ. And we'll see how this works out in some of our discussions. But the whole issue of all of the mosaic economy, the tabernacle, all of the sacrifices, all of those are going to be picture prophecies of the work of the Messiah. But I want to begin really this discussion by looking at Psalm 78. I can read just a couple verses here from Psalm uh, 78. If I can find Psalms. The English order is not the same as the Hebrew order, and I get confused sometimes where things are. For Psalm 78, listen to this. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings of old. I'm going to be speaking to you in a parable, the Lord says. And that word parable, that's translated to parable there, has the idea of being like something. And what's interesting here, that the rest of the psalm, the rest of the psalm is simply a record of Hebrew history. 
It's just history. But yet in the history that is being given, the Lord says, it's a parable. He's saying then that I want you to look at this history of Israel. And he's speaking to Israel. Look at your own history. And there are going to be spiritual lessons. There's something beyond just the facts of history that you must understand. It's like something. You remember in, in Acts when Stephen, remember Stephen, and he's brought and he's going to be killed and they're going to stone him, get ready to kill him. But he gives his defense. And in Acts chapter 7, you read Stephen's defense. And what is in his defense? He gives a whole history. He gives a whole history of God's dealing with Israel. And I remember reading that as a kid. It's just history, 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 history. I remember reading as a kid, you know, Stephen's stalling, right? He's stalling here. He knows what's coming, and so he's just going to go back and, and think about as many things in the Old Testament that he could think of. But no. In that history, he was preaching the gospel. That history was a preaching of the gospel. And those that heard him understood it. That's why they got so mad at him uh, when they was preaching. It wasn't just a matter of recounting. There's something about history. Uh, this thing is bothering me. Mm. Maybe, has my ears changed? I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so. I, I apologize for being so clumsy with this, but it's, it's awkward. I'm not here tonight. You, you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. I'm, so, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Yeah. History and the things in history are going to be used by God in order to teach spiritual lessons. God's a master teacher. He didn't, how did he reveal stuff? He didn't just start throwing all of these great theological terms down to us. Propitiation. Atonement. Expiation, whatever. No, uh, that's not how he revealed. He revealed, oftentimes, I'm saying, in pictures. We talked last night about progressive revelation. Progressive revelation in terms of the content, that's our focus last night. But also, there was a progression of revelation in terms of the manner in which God revealed truth. How you communicate truth is going to be important if that truth is going to be conveyed. I, I remember when I was I was working on my dissertation, so, so this is a few years ago, and my, my older son, about three years old at this time, I'm working at my desk at home, and my kid comes in and he gets underneath my desk, and he's horsing around with my feet and this. And so I said, what are you doing down there? What are you doing down there, Chad? He said, I'm hiding. Okay. Who are you hiding from? I'm hiding from God. So all of a sudden, this becomes more important than my dissertation, right? So I bring the kid. I bring the kid up on, up, up on my knee, and I say, listen, Chad. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. <laughs> Westminster Confession. You're not going to find a better description of who God is and what God is than that statement in Confession. I said, listen, God is infinite in regard to space. He's everywhere. You can't hide from God. Do you understand? No. He leaves. I hear him yelling from his bedroom now that God's not underneath his bed. Right. Now, what's my point? What I told that kid was as orthodox as orthodox could be. But he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue as to what I was saying because the way in which I communicated that truth. So what do you do? You send him to the mother and she takes care of him. <laughs> uh, there's a way. So I'm saying God knew that Israel was in their infancy. And to convey these wonderfully Amazing truths of the gospel. What is the curse reverser going to do? He gives them a series of pictures. 
And these pictures we call, we call types, divinely inspired prophetic analogies or picture prophecies. And I want to see them as prophecies, and I'll make this point as we go through. These are picture prophecies that are in the framework often of what we see as the ceremonial law uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and this is why we don't this is why we don't practice these anymore. These are prophecies, these animals that were sacrificed. Uh, were, were prophecies that had been fulfilled. That's why I'm not looking for another land to be sacrificed. I, I'm not looking for another virgin to conceive and bear a son, nor am I looking for another land to be sacrificed because that was a prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ and not been to be repeated. So it's not that the law has been set aside. The ceremonial law is not, as it were, abrogated. It's been fulfilled. Uh, it's been fulfilled in the word of Christ. All right, so that's generally what I want to talk about uh, this evening. So let's define some terms here. I said in, in one way we're going to be talking about this in terms of X and Y. And God is saying, look at X. Here's something in the real world. Look at X to learn something about Y. Y will be Jesus. So look at X to learn something about Y. And one of the biggest problems that I see with folks as they come to look at these Old Testament types is they get so hung up. They get so hung up on looking at the X's that they forget to look at the Y. We want to, God's not trying to confuse us here. These object lessons are to help us, not to confuse us. So don't get hung up on the X's. Look at the X, but that's to take us to the reality. All right, so you think of those sacrifices? Christ is the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. That's the reality. Here's the picture. And all of this is going to be just a beautiful way that God instructs his people. All right, let me define some terms then before we uh, before we look at how to identify it. Then we'll look at some examples of this as well. Three terms here that I want to make sure we understand. First of all, a symbol. When I talk about a symbol, I'm simply talking about an object lesson. A symbol is going to be an object lesson that was given to the contemporaries to teach them some spiritual truth. It wasn't the truth, but it was designed to illustrate the truth. It was an analogy, all right? A divinely inspired analogy. God is giving them something to look at to teach them a spiritual truth. And uh, not all of symbols are going to be types, but symbols to the contemporary, taught a spiritual lesson. And if, if you couldn't get beyond the picture, you missed the point. I remember as a kid in Sunday school class, you know, I remember a Sunday school teacher giving us a little, had, had a, a little jar of water, a glass of water or something, and put in some food coloring or something, I don't know what it was, and it changed that water into that color. Just a little drop. And the point was, you see, this is like sin, just a, a little bit of sin. A little bit of sin will affect the whole thing. Okay, I got that. Now, I go home after church, and my parents would say, what did you learn in Sunday school today? If, 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 I, if I told them, what I learned in Sunday school today was that if you have a glass of water, put food coloring in it, it changes the color. If that's what I learned, I missed the point. Right? And this is the point. The object lesson was designed to take us to a spiritual reality. And if all we can get is the picture and get hung up on the picture and don't see what it's pointing to, we miss the point. We miss the point. Were there Israelites that missed the point? Yes, there were. There were Israelites that couldn't get past the picture. And they were in serious trouble spiritually. The symbol, then, is the object lesson that is given to the contemporary to teach a particular spiritual truth, but to the contemporary. A type, then, is going to be a symbol with a future reference. Not all symbols have future references. A type is going to be a symbol that has a future referring. Something in the real world now is going to point to something in the future. And the antitype, the antitype is the reality to which it's pointing. 
All right, so the antitype, I'll be using that word antitype probably, that is the reality. That's going to be Jesus. And the type is going to be the illustration. Uh, it's going to be the object lesson then that is going to prophetically reveal to us something about who Jesus is or what Jesus does. It's not without significance to me that the book of Hebrews particularly refers to these things in the Old Testament as shadows. The shadows of things to come. The shadows of better things to come. You think of what a shadow is. You think of a shadow. Uh, shadow is not the reality. I may be walking down a sidewalk. right? I walk down a sidewalk and the sun is shining and I, I, I see my shadow. It doesn't you know, I, I, I can tell it's me. I can tell it's me. And depending upon where the sun is, I like what I see. I'm tall and I'm lean. Right? Uh, other times, I don't like what I see. The sun is a different position. Now I look short and stumpy. Uh, but whether I look tall and lean or short and stumpy, I, I know it's me. It, it represents me. But the shadow is not me. I see the shadow, and I'm the reality. The shadow is obscure. The shadow obscures. It's not, not a perfect picture of me, but I know it's me. The shadow is obscure. The reality. But they were imperfect. Intentionally. Intentionally, these types were imperfect. Intentionally, these types, in one way or another, obscured. Else, if, if it was such a perfect representation, then there would be the confusion uh, between the reality and the subject at hand. So shadows. So these are terms that are going to be interchangeable for us here in our discussions. These divine pictures that the Lord here is giving. All right, now then how do we identify types? And this becomes, I suppose, the major difficulty. You have basically three positions that we can use here. You have some that are going to argue that it is such. If the New Testament identifies it as a type, game over, it's a type. And I would agree. If the New Testament identifies it, it certainly is a type. You have others on the extreme that will see types in everything. And as part of their rush to relevancy, we talked about it a bit last night. How do we, there's so much of the Old Testament that seems to be outdated and outvoted and whatever. How do we rescue this? Well, let's allegorize it, let's spiritualize it. Uh, and, and they see types, they see types almost in everything. And I, I remember even growing up, I would hear sermons, uh, and it, it would be a great blessing uh, as, as these sermons would. Uh, take a text, obscure text, uh, and draw some beautiful statements concerning the gospel and concerning Christ. And remember, I was blessed at the same time I felt bad about myself because I would read those passages and say, I don't see that. How, how can I see that? This must be some great spiritual giant here that is able to see things that I can't see. Uh, yeah, maybe so. But it dawned me one day once I got into this business. But the reason I'm not seeing those things there in that way is because they're not there. Right? Uh, you can be blessed with the consequences of it, but we want to be accurate. So I, I don't want to see types in everything. That's not the way we rescue the Old Testament. Uh, but types are there. Now, the third position, which could be my position, certainly if the New Testament identifies it uh, as a type, it's a type. But I want, to, I want us to learn as well how the New Testament evaluates those passages and that we can use the same hermeneutic, uh, the same principles of interpretation as we identify types in the Old Testament as well. So how do we identify types? I've given some basic things to keep in mind here as we try to identify the types. First of all, divine origin. Types, these picture prophecies, are God's intent. We are not reading something into the text. 
text. All right, we're not reading something into the text. We're reading something out of the text. Technical term here is exegesis, right? We're taking something out of the text. That's the authority. The authority in our preaching, our teaching, our, our heads and what we think we can see, it is based upon the objective statements of the scripture. We want to read out type. It has divine origin. This is God's word, and we want to read out of that the truth that is being expressed. So it's God's word. It's God's word. Next, it has to be historic. Types are based in history. Types are based in history. This is the difference between typology and allegorizing. An allegory, right, is a story with a moral story that has no historical foundation, but with spiritual lessons. Does the Bible have allegories? Are there allegories in the Bible? Sure there are. Uh, you, you think of Ezekiel 16. Here's this little infant, and it's been abandoned, and it's thrown alongside the road, and it's there in the muck and the filth of its birth, and hopeless and helpless. And here comes one says live and lives. And that's a picture of Israel of the Lord. Now that never really happened, right? That, there's no historical foundation for that, but it is a story with a moral. So yes, there are allegories in the Bible. There's a difference between an allegory and allegorizing. Allegorizing is taking something that is real history, ignoring that real history, and just going off on your, your spiritual journey there. I want to avoid allegorizing. If it's an allegory, I interpret it as an allegory. But I'm saying here's the difference between an allegory and types. Allegories have no historical foundation. Types are based in history. A real thing, a real person, a real event now has this parable idea. It's like something God is saying, look at this to see that. So it's got to be based in history. It has to be symbolic to the contemporary. This is going to be help, one of the ways that will help me to identify that this is not something that I'm just seeing. In, in that context, is this symbolic an object lesson to the contemporary people? I look for that. Does it have then a future referring? Here's the prophetic aspect. And then is it redemptive? Right? It's going to have a redemptive message. It's going to have a redemptive message. Uh, so if I keep these criteria in mind, I think that will be a way that we can protect ourselves and keep ourselves on track as we seek to identify what these types are. Then we want to keep the antitype in focus. These are analogies. They have to be analogous to something. <clears throat> Let me put it this way. Types never introduce truth. Types do not introduce truth. Types are going to uh, illustrate, be a picture of truths that have already been established, right? that have already been revealed. They don't initiate the truth, the doctrine, whatever. So I want to keep the antitype in focus. And here's where our whole understanding of Jesus is going to come into play. I think sometimes people, and I, and I talk to folks and students even uh, over the years that say, I, I don't see Jesus. I don't see Jesus here. Uh, and I think sometimes it's because we don't know what we're looking for. Right? We want to keep in mind what we're looking for. Uh, and I don't have to see all of it. I don't, see, I don't have to see all of Jesus to see Jesus. Uh, I've been married my wife. There she is. Uh, for 51 years. 51 years. That's a long time. Uh, I know her. I know her. If you put my wife in a crowd and all I could see was the back of her head, I could pick her out of that crowd because I know her. I know her. 
And if we know Jesus, just my point, if we know Jesus and the full orb of who he is and what he does, I don't have to see all of them to see him. And so I say we keep the antitype in focus. What do I know about what has already been revealed about Jesus, about the curse reversal that will help us identify something new about him? So we keep Jesus in mind. And know the kinds of things that God used. And types are going to be people, events, or things. These are the things that God uses as these object lessons. Now, in regard to people, people are types of Christ. People are types of Christ by virtue of their office and not by virtue of their character. By virtue of their office and not by virtue of their character. There is not a man that has ever lived that by virtue of his character is going to be the type of Jesus. Or by virtue of the office. And particularly the messianic office, the mediatorial office, prophets, priests, kings. There's a way in which every Old Testament prophet, <clears throat> every Old Testament prophet, by virtue of his office, is a type of Christ. There is, by virtue of office, every Old Testament priest becomes a type of Christ. Every king, every king, by virtue of office, becomes a type of Christ, not by virtue of his person. Oh, I don't have a problem. Yeah, we don't have a problem that David, great type of Christ. Solomon, great type of Christ. Yeah, they are. By virtue of their office. But Ahab, Ahaz, yeah, by virtue of office, type of Christ. You can see the way, when is the ideal Jesus going to come? When is the ideal Christ going to come, the ideal king? And all of these contribute by virtue of the function of the office. A person is going to be a type. I, I, I mentioned at the, the luncheon today, uh, a disagreement sometimes that I have with my wife. We don't we don't disagree on many things, but we sometimes will have a disagreement as to whether or not Joseph was a type. Right? Was Joseph a type? And she says yes, and I says no. He's not. She says, "But well, look at him. He's like Jesus this way, this way, this way." Listen, and I say, "You're right. He's like Jesus in every one of those ways, but he's like Jesus. It's not that Jesus is like him." And there's a big difference there. But I don't know if I've ever admitted this to you, right? Uh, so I, I make this public admission to you tonight. In, in the book of Genesis, in, in the historical setting, I don't think that Joseph in any way was a type to his brothers, not a type of Christ to his brothers at all. Uh, they didn't see that. But in the canonical, remember last time we made a difference between the historic context and the canonical context. In the canonical context, Genesis was written to the people at the Exodus, the people receiving Leviticus also. And, I, and I'm ready to admit, Sander, that Joseph is a type of Christ canonically, but not historically. All right? So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> As a deliverer. But not by virtue of all his Christ-like characteristics. That's his sanctification. But by virtue of the fact that he was the deliverer of the people. And that goes all the way through. We mentioned Cyrus today. Book of Isaiah. A great messianic prophecy, but the only time the term Moshiach occurs, Messiah occurs, uh, is in reference to Cyrus, a pagan king. A pagan king, an idolater. But a great type of Christ, because he was the deliverer of the people. So the person, we talk, when we see a person, that every, every prophet, priest, king, by virtue of office, is going to have that typical, uh, that typical function. <coughs> events. Events. So this brings us to the Exodus. And God's delivering uh, the people from that place of bondage. What, what an event that was. And it becomes a great paradigm. A great paradigm of what God does in saving uh, his people. And every, every step of the way becomes a prophecy then of Christ, who's the Passover lamb. Uh, and a great message there. The whole sacrificial system. The whole sacrificial system. Where 
and, and we'll touch on this a bit later perhaps, uh, with, with all the steps of the sacrifice and all of those events are picture prophecies of the Lord Jesus. And then certain things. Classic example of that certainly would be the tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was erected in the wilderness, and then later the temple. This was an object lesson of God's meeting with his people and pointing uh, to God and pointing to Christ who came to dwell with his people. And all of the activities uh, of the tabernacle, all the structure of the tabernacle, had typical significance, uh, spiritual lessons that find their ultimate fulfillment uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I say, let's be uh, sensitive to the kinds of things that God is going to use for these types, and then be sensitive to the contextual clues, and that really brings us into the uh, issues that we talked about uh, last uh, last night. So there are some guidelines. There are some guidelines that uh, we want to use before we just jump into uh, recognizing a type and significance thereof. We keep these in mind. I think it'll keep us. It'll keep us on track. All right. Now that's how we identify types. How do we interpret types? Three things. And I, I, I like to interpret types the same way that I would interpret a figure of speech because it, it is. It's, it's, it's an analogy. It's a figure that the Lord is giving to us. And when you come to a figure of speech. There are three things that we want to identify. The topic, which here would be the antitype, the image, which is the type, and then the point of similarity. What is true about the image that applies to the topic? I said we're going to interpret types then the same way that I would interpret a metaphor or economy, so any kind of figure of speech. You know, this illustration had two boys. And uh, when they were living at home, I, I would go into their bedroom and I would see what their room looked like. And I would say, You guys, you guys are pigs. You're pigs. Now, that's a metaphor. All right, that's a metaphor. How do we interpret that? Cop. My boy's living habits. Image. Pigs. Now, what's the point of similarity between a pig and my boys? Pigs have a curly tail. <laughs> my sons don't. That's not the point of similarity. <laughs> my a pig has a kind of a flat nose there, right? Oh, no, that doesn't apply either. What, what, what's the point of similarity? The point of similarity is pigs are sloppy, right? Pigs are sloppy. You guys are sloppy. So that's the point. I, I don't want to just think of as many points as I can. There's one main point of similarity that has the topic in mind. Let's change the scenario. Now we're at the dinner table. We're at the dinner table, and my boys are eating, and they have a, a, a tendency sometimes to make certain noises when they ate, right? It didn't bother me. It bothered my wife. And so when we, they would make these noises, I would say, you guys are pigs. You are pigs. Topic. Now my boy's eating habits. Image pigs. Point of similarity. The point of similarity now is not their sloppiness, but they're grunting and making those noises when they... So the point of similarity is going to be singular. And I'm saying that because there's a tendency sometimes, and this applies to the parables of the Lord Jesus, uh, but he talks about, in essence, here's an analogy, look at this, look at this. The tendency is to over-interpret it, right? To over-interpret it. To find as many points of similarity between X and Y as you could possibly think of. No. No, we don't want to use our imagination. We don't want to multiply points of similarity. Typically, there's going to be one main point from the context that is going to be the major focal point of the 
uh, intention. So there's going back to Cyrus, type of Christ. Cyrus was a pagan, was Jesus a pagan? Of course not. Cyrus was an idolater. Jesus is not. Cyrus was Persian. Jesus is not. A lot of things about Cyrus obviously did not apply to Jesus. But what it did apply was the fact that he was the deliverer of the people. That's the main, that's the main point. So key thing here is don't is don't overinterpret. Don't overinterpret uh, the types are typically going to be one major idea. Something that will not be contrary to context. So, you know, for instance, something that is bad is not going to be tied to something that's good. Uh, I, I've heard people say, for instance, there's Solomon. Solomon had all of these concubines, all of these wives. That's not good, right? That wasn't good. But I've heard it applied that this then becomes uh, a, a picture of Christ expanding the church, right, <laughs> to uh, all... Yeah, no, no, no. You don't take something bad and turn it into something good. We want to be careful. All right, be careful. So there are some guidelines. I want to use the New Testament if I can as a guide uh, that will help me here in the identification. All right, so those are some general introductory ideas. I want to give some examples uh, of how Christ is set up in the Old Testament through types, these picture prophecies. Uh, and this could go on forever and ever in many ways. Well, we'll take a look at a couple. Let's, this thing is really bugging me tonight. Take, take a look at the, the sacrificial system. All right, take a look at the sacrificial system. Keeping in mind now the canonical context that we set up last night. The canonical context of those sacrifices same as the book of Genesis. Genesis has made one clear. Genesis has made clear that salvation is going to be, the curse reverser is going to be in a person. It's going to be a man that comes into the human race as the curse reverser. And uh, we learn that this covenant is a matter of faith. Uh, Abraham becomes a great example, right? Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. In the context of that covenant, that covenant that has revealed this coming seed. Now, in Genesis 15, when it makes that statement, it's just after he describes the seed of Abraham being like the stars of the heaven and multitude, whatever, uh, and it says that Abraham believed God. That's not the commencement of Abraham's faith. Uh, again, I don't want to get into all the aspects of Hebrew grammar or whatever, but the verb there that is typically translated as a simple past is actually a habitual idea of a translator that Abraham had been believing God. So that is not the statement of his initial conversion faith. He had been believing God back from his call uh, for Ur of the Chaldees. And God counted that as righteousness. Not faith, but God imputed righteousness to him and faith the means. So it establishes faith. What I'm saying is the Abrahamic covenant establishes the means here uh, of salvation as being faith in that coming in that coming seed. So now we bring this in now to Leviticus. You cannot you cannot begin Understanding Old Testament religion by starting at Leviticus. It's going to give the wrong impression. Okay? Put it within the framework of the theology of Genesis. Curse reverse for man, God man, by faith, not by any words. So, brought up of Egypt. Passover, I'll come back to the Passover. Let's look at those sacrifices. You've got two different categories of sacrifices. You have what's called the sweet savor sacrifices, and you have the, the guilt offerings. The sweet savor sacrifices were the whole bird offering, the meal offering, cereal offering, grain offering, if you will, and the peace offering. And then you have the sin offering and the guilt offering, the trespass offering for those 
in the other category. Begins with the whole burnt offering. Now, all of those sacrifices have certain things in common. And certain things in common. First of all, the selection. Selection of the animal. Depending upon the sacrifices, it could be a goat, could be a sheep, could be male, could be female. Different sacrifices, a lot of different things. But one thing was sure. It had to be without blemish. It had to be without blemish. As you pick out this sacrifice, this lamb, you make sure that it is without any blemish. No defect. No defect. It had to be perfect. Uh, as far as the animal was concerned. Now, what does that say? What does that say? It's telling us that salvation has to be from someone outside of myself. Here is this one that is chosen. Here's this one that is chosen, that is perfect, that is pure, that is undefiled. What a picture that is of Jesus, you see. What a picture that is of a coming redeemer. Uh, has to be, has to be perfect. And the New Testament plays on this. Uh, here's Jesus, Peter says, this lamb without spot, without blemish. Yeah. Well, that was pictured. That was, I don't have to wait to Peter to figure that out. This is what Moses was teaching the people, what God was teaching them through Moses, that this sacrifice had to be perfect. Then, you lay your hand. You lay your hand. On that animal. Literally, you lean on it. You lean, you put your weight on that animal. A picture here then of the transfer, of the guilt and the sin of that one who brought the sacrifice, now being transferred to that innocent victim. My guilt now upon this innocent victim. What a picture that is of Jesus. Can you see that? Sure. That Christ took upon himself. He was perfect. He was pure. But he took upon himself. He took upon himself the chastisement with a view to our peace. He took our iniquities upon him. And it's not without significance that when Isaiah is describing that in chapter 53, he refers to this servant as the Asha. He refers to this as the sin offering. Isaiah had enough sense to realize that the asham, that the sin offering was not this goat or this bull, but it was this servant that was going to come, this Messiah, taking upon himself the sins of his people. Then the next step in the sacrifice was for the offerer to slay the sacrifice. The offerer slew the sacrifice. The personal responsibility, the personal involvement, that this animal now that is going to be dying is dying for me. It's dying for me. I'm the one responsible for putting this one to death. Other sacrifices, the priest did that, but the daily sacrifices, you brought it, then you kill it. You kill it. I'm responsible. I'm responsible. It was what a picture that brings of Jesus, does not There the cross. My sins. My sins were laid upon him. It's my guilt. It's my guilt that put that, that, that led him to that place of Calvary. My fault. And then the priest would come. And now he would take the blood. The priest would gather the blood from that sacrifice, and depending upon what the sacrifice was, sprinkled some here, sprinkled some there. But the, the use of the blood, the use of the blood, the importance of the blood is satisfying God's wrath against my sin, the propitiatory aspect of this, appeasing God's wrath, the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. That was true in the book of Hebrews, and it's true in all the Levitical system as well, there had to be the shedding of the blood. And then putting in the whole burnt offering, in the whole burnt offering, the entirety of that victim was placed upon the altar. Burned. Every bit of it. 
In some of the sacrifices, the priest got some. In the peace offering, the offerer got some, and the altar got some, the priest got some. But on the whole, we're offering everything. Was there placed upon the altar? Picture now of the consecration. Here's the gratitude. Here's the gratitude for that deliverance of what the atonement is doing, the gratitude that we put ourselves completely upon that altar. What a picture that is, again, of the application of the gospel to the lives of the people. Paul says, considering all these gospel truths, therefore present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul understood that. And there's the picture. And then the peace offering, there was the eating of the meal, a picture of fellowship and reconciliation. I'm saying that each of those steps of the sacrifice, each of those steps of the sacrifice had a direct line. God is saying, look at this, look at X to see Y. Look at this animal to see Jesus, the lamb that was slain, the foundation of the world. Beautiful picture, that whole sacrificial system. But to understand Leviticus just in terms of goats and sheep and bulls, you miss the point. They're object lessons. They're object lessons that God was giving to the people to point them to that lamb that was slain for the foundation of the world. And then when we put all the antecedent theology there, then I say we have every war. We're not making this up. This is not something that I'm reading back into it. Not something that I'm reading uh, into it from my theology books. No, this is what God intended by the picture. Let's go back to the Passover just for a moment. What a picture of the gospel that is. Here's Egypt, taskmasters, Israel in bondage for these hundreds of years. The Passover speaks to us of, of the sovereignty of God's grace, doesn't it? Bondage, misery. But why? Moses goes in and he says, there's going to be people that die, the firstborn. The firstborn are going to die tonight. Firstborn are going to die. But some are going to live. And that raises the gospel question. Why is it that some die and some live on that Passover night? What was the difference between life and death? Was it because Israel was persecuted saints? No, they were as wicked and idolaters as the Egyptians were. Oh, there's a remnant there for sure. But for the most of them, they were just as wicked and as guilty as but some were going to live and some were going to Why? What was the difference? It was grace. It was grace. Here's the sovereignty of grace that is evident in that, in that event. Now we're talking about an event. And then the selection of the animal. It's going to be this Passover sacrifice. Now you get the animal. Again, you take from your herd the best without spot, without blemish. And then you set it aside. As I recall, the animal was selected, what, on the 10th day? On the 10th day of the month? And it was kept in isolation until the 14th day of the month, before it was slain. Now the question then, why was it set apart? Why was it isolated for those few days. I would suggest to you that the reason for that, a period of examination, a period of observation to make sure, to make sure that that lamb of sacrifice was pure and spotless and undefiled, that it was worthy then to be the sacrifice. Period of isolation. You think of the incarnation. Why is it? Why is it that Jesus didn't die the next day after he came. Why did Jesus live for those 30 odd years in the sight of men, in the sight of God? Made of a wall. The same law that you and I are made under, Jesus was made under that law, the law that was righteous in every way. But here's a life. The life of Jesus, and certainly we in the reform camp know what it is to make much of the life of Christ as much as the death of Christ. The death of Christ could not have done what it did unless the life of Christ was what it was. Perfect and pure. But how was it proven? There's the temptation. 
Right? There's a temptation, Satan. That doesn't work. Tempted at every point, like as we are, but no. So in the sight of God, in the sight of the devil, in the sight of man, Jesus in his life was pure and spotless and undefiled, the worthy sacrifice. And then after that type of examination, then we have the slave. We have the slave of the sacrifice. The lamb was killed. The lamb was killed. That death had to happen. The death was the execution of justice. The wages of sin is death. And justice, if I can put it this way, doesn't really care how you die. It doesn't care the way that the death takes place. It just demands death. The wages of sin is death. And the slaying of that animal, the slaying of that animal was the execution of justice against the gods of Egypt, against the Egyptians, against sin itself. Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins, according to the scriptures. But the death, in and of itself, was not enough. There had then to be the application and the manipulation, if you will, of the blood. The blood then of that sacrifice was taken. It wasn't the carcass of the lamb that was put on the doorpost or on the, on the door stoop. No, it wasn't the carcass, it was the blood. You take that blood and you put that blood upon, you put that blood upon the lintels and upon the doorposts. And it was the blood. So the sacrifice, death for certain, but the blood shedding of necessity. That's what the atonement is. And all of that, again, points to Jesus. Our pa Paul says that Jesus is our Passover, doesn't he? Here's Christ, our Passover, that is the sacrifice for us. So a lesson there is substitutionary atonement. You have a lesson there in sovereign grace. You have a lesson in faith. You have a lesson in faith. Moses declared, firstborn, if you're the firstborn, you're going to die. Right across the board. And, and there was no age limit by that, by the way. When talking about those who were 12 and under, I'm the firstborn of my family. And even at my approaching middle age years, I would have been under the sentence of death. I'm the firstborn. No matter how old you were, you were the firstborn, you're in the sense of death. They heard that. And I've often wondered what would be, what would have been like that night as the firstborn? Normally, a position of advantage, but not that night. To be the firstborn that night was under the sentence of death. You heard Moses say what he said. It's going to be death. But you also heard what Moses said about the sacrifice. You get under the blood. You get under the blood. There's deliverance. And so the blood is there. The blood is there and you enter in. You enter in. I've often wondered how that night was spent by the first Lord. My guess is my guess is that there were some firstborn that night that heard what Moses said. They heard the message, they saw the blood being put there, and they enter in and out. But I imagine they tossed and turned. Restless night. Tossed and turning, can't sleep. Oh, I wonder what. And then somebody else, another firstborn. Heard the same thing, now enters in behind the door with the blood, and he sleeps like a baby, calm, peaceful, no problem. One wrestled, doubted, restlessness, the other perfect. But what happened the next morning? They both survived. See? 
The one that doubted and the one that was restless came out, and the one that was at peace came out, because it's not, it is not the exercise of faith. And what a beautiful lesson this is God is teaching us about the gospel. It is not the exercise of faith just that is, it's the object of faith. It is the object of faith that determines the value of faith. Some have weak faith, some have strong faith. That's, we want our faith to grow. But so many people are wrestling. Am I, am I believing enough? Am I sincere enough? How sincere do you have to be? <coughs> the Bible never says, does it? I know how much faith I need to, 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 to move a mountain or a tree. Size of greater mustard seed. But the Bible never says how much how much faith I need to be saved. But it does point me to the object of faith. And the Passover focuses attention upon the object of faith. It is the object of faith that determines the value of faith. Get under the blood. It's what it is when I look, Jesus, the Lord said, When I see the blood, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And I think too many are trying to shake their heads out of the window and see how much of the blood they see. It's when I see the blood, the Lord says. That there, now, I'm telling you, if you can't see Jesus through that whole thing, I don't know where you're looking. What a beautiful picture that is. Just a picture. A picture prophecy that's been fulfilled. So I'm not looking to repeat all of those details. No, those were pictures that God was giving, analogies that would draw our attention to the reality of who Jesus is. So events, events. I've already mentioned the persons that by virtue of their office. You, you take things, and obviously the tabernacle is a classic example of God meeting with his people. That God tabernacle with his people. The Emmanuel concept that finds his ultimate consummation and fulfillment in the incarnation, again, pointing to Jesus. So, everything about that tabernacle, in one way or another, full pattern of heaven for sure. But a prophecy of God coming in flesh to dwell among us in the person of Christ and the whole structure of the tabernacle with all the furniture of the tabernacle. Is teaching how it is that a man can get to God. How do you get to God? How do you get to God? And I don't have time. My session is almost over, I guess. How, how, how do you get to God? There's the, the, the structure, the, the tripartite the structure, structure of the tabernacle, outer court, and the sanctuary, and then behind the veil, the most holy place. And the closer you get behind the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was, that manifest representation of the present, uh, uh, the ark was just an object lesson, right? The ark was just an object lesson. God never lived in a box. You know, God was not that box, but that box represented. It was a picture of the presence of God with his people. And, and what it communicated in terms of the structure, of it, it's overlaid with gold, the majesty, and the wood, the humanity, and inside was the law calling for condemnation. A beautiful picture. But on top of that was the mercy seat, that atoning lid that took the blood on the Day of Atonement and all was well. I don't have time to talk about the Day of Atonement, but I would sort of like to. But how do you get to God? It starts with the altar. Sacrifices first. The sacrifices first. And as you get to that altar and you offer the sacrifice, the only the way that God is restricted, the tabernacle was clear that the way that God is restricted, you can't just barge in to the presence of God is restricted. And the closer you got to God, the more restriction. But it's not Christianity restricted. It's not Christian. The one true religion is narrow. We are extremely narrow. This is why the world doesn't like us so much, you know, because we are inflexible. We are inflexible. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. The only way to get to God is to get through Jesus. And the tabernacle is a picture of that. Sacrifice first, then the laser, the cleansing, picture of sanctification, and you get inside the veil, and ultimately behind the veil was the presence of God and the high priest. 
was a walking object lesson of, of the work of Christ. A walking object lesson of the work of Christ. Dressed in his royal garments, royalty, setting that aside on the day of atonement, taking it all off. And on the simplicity of his linen, under garments, he makes his way behind the veil. Sprinkles the blood of the sacrifice and now comes back out. Is entering in a picture of death, is coming out a picture of resurrection. Beautiful picture. I'm saying, have your eye open. My time is gone here, it looks like. But have your eye open. Have your eye open. If you have your eye open for Jesus, you'll see Jesus. The whole redemptive message. It may not be a title of Christ, it may not be a particular prophecy, but in one way or another, in one way or another, the Old Testament is developing and establishing for us this redemptive message. And you can't think of redemption apart from the Lord Jesus. Yeah. I guess I'll stop. But don't ignore your old testament. It's a Christian, it's a Christian testament. It's full of Jesus.